Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Are we all in agreement? Effective decision making in the family business. Some brief housekeeping as we get started. Your control panel allows you to choose how you participate in the audio portion of the program. You have joined in listen only mode and will remain muted throughout the program. We welcome your questions and comments in the questions panel. We've set aside time at the end of the program to address those questions, so feel free to enter them throughout the program as they occur to you. We'll answer as many of them as we can during our time together. We're scheduled for a 60 minute program, including that question and answer time. Today's program is also being recorded. Shortly after the program, you'll receive an email, which will include the presentation slides and some additional educational resources that relate to today's topic. The recording of the presentation will be available within 48 hours, and you'll receive a separate email on how to access that recording. So please allow at least 48 hours to receive our follow-up email with the recording instructions. At the end of today's program, you'll also be asked to complete a brief survey on your experience today. We greatly appreciate your feedback and use your responses to help us plan future programs. A couple of important notes as we get started. First, we value confidentiality. We often use cases and scenarios to describe the concepts that we're exploring in these discussions. Any cases shared are publicly available, approved for use, or are composites from many common client experiences. And to allow for the most open participation in the Q&A sessions, Questions that you ask in the program today will answer using your first name only. This is also an educational dialogue. Approaches and ideas we describe may be helpful in a number of situations, but a best practice is only a best practice if it's best for your family. We encourage you to draw ideas from today's discussion and consider them in the context of your situation and to consult advisors for guidance and support as appropriate. And with that, let's say hello to today's presenters. First, we have Jean Meeks Koch, who is a consultant of the Family Business Consulting Group, specializing in advising family enterprises facing significant organizational transitions. She has extensive experience in large scale change management initiatives, organizational systems and restructuring. She also helps family businesses with leadership and team development, executive coaching and assessments. Jean is based in Charleston. Welcome, Jean. Thank you, Christy. Also with us is Joshua Nacht, who is a consultant with the Family Business Consulting Group and works with business families to leverage their strengths by focusing on effective governance, communication, and transitions. He is adept at working with multi-generational families to integrate diverse perspectives and create strong ownership groups by developing structured plans for continuity. He is also an active family business owner and draws from his experiences in his work with families. Josh is based in Denver. Hi, Josh. Hello, good morning, everybody. And my name is Christy Data. I am your host and moderator for today. So let's go right into today's conversation. I'm gonna turn things over to Jean, who will start us off with an overview of our topic today and why decision-making is important for family businesses. Thank you, Christy, and welcome everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. We're gonna talk a little bit about decision-making and why is it important? So let's just kick it off with why is decision-making important and why is it really the root of all business success? Well, if we peel back decision-making just a little bit, decisions form the basis of all our communication, whether we are working together to figure out a roadmap, a plan, a direction, or we're even informing people because that information came from a decision that was made by one person, a group of person, people are several in a community. So life doesn't happen without a decision. So think about it like this. We need to be going in the same direction. We need to be all on board. We need to be able to, to make a decision that people will buy into, that people can build consensus around and get excited about. So think about a school of fish. Fish swim in a certain direction, right? They've made a decision to swim that way. There might be a leader of the pack, but they're all moving in the same direction. Also think of a great rowing team. They're all pulling in the same direction. Somebody is not paddling backwards. We wouldn't be moving to win the race. So with decision-making, getting buy-in is really important and building consensus is even greater. So with that, 
I'm going to turn it over to Josh to tell us a little bit about decision making and its two parts. Thanks, Jean. So we really like to think of decision making having two key parts or two key dimensions. And the first is logistical and structural. And what this means is having really clear understandings around uh, roles. We all know many of you think of the multiple roles that you play in your own family business. We need to be clear about those roles. We have to understand on an individual basis what those roles are. And then as a group, what it means uh, when we're operating within those roles. The more clear we are, the better we can make decisions together. Along with those roles, we have to understand well, what are the responsibility of those roles? You know, when I'm sitting in a board meeting, there's certain responsibilities that may be different than when I'm in a family uh, reunion or a family shareholder meeting. So understanding those responsibilities is really important for clear decision making. Along with those decisions also comes accountability. When we make decisions, uh, we need to be accountable for those decisions, both small and large. And who holds each other accountable? So being clear about that helps the entire system make effective decisions. That flows into agreements. When we make agreements together, we can operate with the same rules. And that's those agreements can be behavioral, as we'll see in a moment, or around these structural pieces and understanding where decisions are made. And we also need really good information. We need information in advance of the decision. We need the proper information to make the decision. And then we need to know afterwards what the follow-up was and how the decision affects our information. Those things are more logistical and structural, right? We can, we can map them out a little bit easier, but in order to make all those aspects work, we also have to attend to the human and the interpersonal dimension of decision-making. So we need to look at individual behaviors and how individuals show up to meetings, both physically and mentally and emotionally. You know, how do people communicate both in terms of body language and tone and are people making directives or people asking questions? So there's a lot in looking at your individual behaviors that affect communication and decision making. It's also important to look at the trust in your environment and the trust in your family. If you're a high trust family, decisions are going to be made in a, in a certain way and those discussions may look different than if there's a low trust situation or if there's low trust with a certain individual. Decisions can help us build trust. They can also help erode trust, unfortunately, if they're not done in a way that feels good to everybody. So the trust really matters for the process of decision making. Also, one of the unique aspects of a family business are that we hold multiple relationships. So what are those relationships in your family? strong, long-lasting relationships lets us make decisions in a certain way that may be a little bit smoother, more uh, focused. If the relationships aren't as strong or more distant, it may make decision-making more difficult or lead to a process that needs a little bit more care. All of decision-making is, is really involved with communication and how we speak together. Again, this relates to individual behaviors, but it's really what are the norms for communication? How do we speak together? How do we ask questions together? Do we make sure that everybody's voice is heard? And you know, we can make agreements about that. And as we'll see later in the webinar, there's a great opportunity for making agreements as a group about how we make decisions, how we interact together. It can have a really positive effect on the entire process. So an important thing in family business is to recognize this different stages. And Jean, can you help us more understand more about these stages and how that affects decision making? Sure, absolutely, Josh. So being a family business, a multi-generational family business is exciting. It's very exciting. But as we know in family business, as we move from the founder stage to a sibling, G2 stage and on to the cousin stages in G3 and then onward in G4 and continuing, uh, you know, as far as you want to go, uh, decision making becomes more complex over time. One is there's just more people involved, more people who feel they should have 
a seat at the table and should have a say in the decision. So when we look at the G1, the founder stage, and think back, if you're a G1 or if you're in a different stage, think back about that G1. Very entrepreneurial, they started the business, they made the decision. If it was a dad and a mom who started the business, you know, maybe they made the decisions jointly together. They knew their roles and who decided what. They really, really were the ones that said, you know, to the siblings, okay, I want you in the family business. You're going to do this role. You'll have this responsibility. There wasn't a decision on how do we come up with a family employment policy? You know, if the parents said you're coming to work in the family business, you were probably coming to work in the family business. So not a lot of decision choices by the siblings. So really moving from this idea of being a more of a proprietorship into the family business, we get into the sibling generation. And therein lies a lot of change in how do we make decisions. Okay. So what's the rationale for making the decision? Do I get to make the decision because I'm the oldest one of the family? Do I get to have the last say because I'm the youngest one of the family? Do we fall back into those sibling roles that we played or do we now engage in making decisions based on other roles and the responsibilities that we have? This can lead to tension. This can lead to, you know, jockeying for position within siblings, jockeying for different roles, you know, where we get a little bit uh, challenged with what's my role in the business versus what's my role within the family system. So into the sibling generation, we find a great need to know who makes what decision, how do we get to those decisions, and why is that important for the strength of continuity. Moving into the cousin generation, now we're coming from various nuclear families and we're coming together and our nuclear family might have slightly different visions of certain things based on what's happening in our nuclear family. Now we have to have a shared vision, shared vision for the family enterprise, the family legacy. We're going to have multiple roles happening within the cousins. There are going to be people that are working in the business and there are going to be people that are shareholders or family members that are not working in the business. So how are they involved with decision making and what are the important decisions? Herein lies the greatest piece that we start bringing in is governance. How do we create family governance and corporate governance to really look at decision making? So with that, let's talk a little bit. I always get asked, asked the question, what does decision making look like in a family business? And I have to, to pause and say, hmm, well, it depends. Because as you know, Every family enterprise is unique. We're a unique collection and community of individuals with sharedness that's not like any other family enterprise business. So again, it depends. Depends what's important to your family system. So some families are very formal and become very formalized in how they make their decisions. They they create a family constitution and in, within the family constitution, they'll lay out policies and protocols and, and how to make decisions and how to work through the decision. And they'll put in strong governance. But you'll also have families that might say, you know what, we don't want all that formality. We want some structure and some, I call it the white line, the boundaries around how we make decisions, and they'll be more informal based. So again, there's not a right and a wrong. It's really what works best for your family. But one of the things I really encourage my families to do is really build consensus, build buy-in, you know, because if it's one or a small group of individuals that have made the decision and it's being hammered down that, okay, everybody, we're women in this direction, and people don't understand the why and why are we doing this, okay? they're not going to build buy-in and excitement and enthusiasm around the decision. So consensus-based decision-making becomes a really positive way in multi-generational families. And last and most important is whatever you put into place for decision-making, make sure that you're still able to get to decisions in a time that is required to get that decision made so that you don't lose opportunities. 
So agility and speed are two important things to remember as you put in decision-making policies. I want to um, turn this over to Josh now to talk a little bit about governance and, and the strength of all the systems in the family enterprise. Thanks, Jean. Uh, so governance really refers to the dedicated time and space, a dedicated forum for making effective decisions together. Uh, and that looks like different things in different areas of governance. You know, family governance meetings, family council meetings are going to concern matters that are a little bit more related to the family and the ownership group. And then the board of directors is going to focus a little bit more on the business and vision and strategy for the business that's absolutely informed by those family governance meetings. So what we're looking at in this diagram is just trying to understand that you know, it's important to know that different decisions are made in different areas. And strength throughout the system comes from balanced and effective governance between the family, the ownership group, and the business and management. And that's achieved through family councils and family governance meetings. And it's also achieved through a board of directors between the ownership and the business. And the key here, and we'll see this in the next slide, is understanding where decisions are made. And a lot of families that I've worked with said, well, we're, say, you know, we're having trouble understanding. Well, what do we do in a family council meeting? What does the board of directors do? And in that case, what I recommend is, well, we need to map this out. And this speaks to the logistical and structural aspect. And we can create something called a decision-making matrix. Now, what we have here is an example only. And what we, I'm gonna say this up front, what we really encourage is that in your family, you can start with a blank decision-making matrix and start to fill it in. You know, where do you know, okay, we know as a family council, some of our jobs to make decisions on our family values, vision, and mission. The shareholders have influence in that decision. So we can map out, as you see here with the, the D, the decision making responsibility is in the family council. Shareholders have influence because the entire shareholder group may be too large or cumbersome to make that decision. Obviously, in your system, if you have a three-person shareholder group, some of those decisions may be made there. So for you, the D may be in that area. We can see something more complex like philanthropy. Well, the shareholder group may make the ultimate decision on, on philanthropic giving, but you know the family council may have influence and input on that decision. The board of directors may also have influence on in that decision because they, in conjunction with management, would like to make sure that any philanthropic efforts are aligned with the purpose and the good of the business. So what we encourage here is utilizing a decision-making making matrix that's going to work for your family business. You, we would recommend taking this and saying, well, okay, this is how we have to do it. We recommend starting with a blank decision-making matrix and filling in where you're clear about where decisions are made. And in those areas where there's gaps or you don't know, that's an opportunity to sit down together as a group and say, where is this decision made? Who should have influence in it? Who should be informed about this decision? Um, this is an example matrix, as we've said. We have a more uh, complete decision-making matrix it will be emailed to you after the webinar. And in, in my work with families, I've really seen this be an effective tool to help bring that structure and the logistics about where decisions are made so we can make more effective decisions together. And Jean, can you help us see what this might look like in action? Sure, so I have. So one of the things I enjoy doing with my families is to, <laughs> Uh, break them up generationally with with a decision making matrix. Come up with what are all of the key component decisions that are your critical ones. And I usually ask them to come up with maybe 15, many of them you see right here, 15 to 20. 
so that, you know, we're not tackling too many things at one time. And then, for example, I might get together with all the G2s and we'll look at the decision-making matrix with the 15 to 20 items on it. And we'll work through what, where they think the decision is at, is at and who should influence it. And then what I'll do is I'll do the same thing with, say, the G3 generation. I'll take the exact 15 to 20 uh, decisions, and I'll work with them and say, let's get together and build consensus around what you think the decision makers should be and the influencers should be. And then what I'll do is I'll take the, the two of them together and I'll bring both groups together, whether it's doing some of it virtually with members that can't come together, and we'll compare both of them and see where are we aligned generationally as a family and where are we not aligned. And then we'll look at the ones that were not aligned and we'll discuss and build consensus and build to alignment. And it's a great way to really get consensus built within a decision-making matrix. So I encourage you to try that out. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the interpersonal side of being a good decision maker. As Josh touched on at the very beginning, the logistical, structural, but then there's a human component that's required to make a really, to be a really great decision maker. And, and when you look at it, what, what does it take to be a good engaged? And I think the important word here is engaged decision maker, right? So I always encourage people, when you're coming in to making some decisions, what's your mindset? What, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about, you know, how this has never worked in the past before? How, you know, my brother or my cousin always gets the best, you know, and last say? What's your mindset? Are you coming in with a real clear mindset, ready to contribute and ready to be involved? And leaving that past history behind. So I think that's important. Check your mindset. What is it? The next question I always ask my families is, how do you plan to build consensus? There's so many different ways to build consensus. So as a family, if you're trying to build consensus in a large group of, say, uh, I'll make numbers easy, let's say 20 people trying to, to make a decision on a, um, a mission statement, you know, how do you build consensus? How do you maybe break it apart into five smaller groups that can build consensus and then bring the two groups of five together? Now you have a group of 10 to take each idea and build consensus and then bring it all together to the greater good of the whole. So how do you plan to tackle the building of the consensus? That's very important. The third thing I really encourage is safety. Okay. Safety and having a safe environment. What does safety mean for the family? Okay. And so really coming in with the mindset that, you know, we don't want to belittle. We don't want to attack anybody. We want to really be open to hear what somebody else says, regardless of what generational age they are. Okay. People bring different elements to the table. And can we be open to listening to them? Which really dovetails into giving everyone a voice. Are we taking turns? Is, does everybody have an opportunity to speak? And how are we facilitating or moderating that? Is there a leader of the group that's moderating that, that is capable of, if somebody really is talking all the time and talking over everybody, that's able to say, you know, Cousin Johnny, we've really heard from you and we really appreciate your comments, but Cousin Annie, can we hear from you now? And really pulling people out so that we're giving all people a voice. That's extremely important. I also encourage individuals as they're coming into decision making, is where are you at with your own EQ? Are you self-aware of the things you do? Many times we're not. So do we take time to ask other family members, how do I interact in a meeting? What are some areas of improvement I can do? What are my strengths and what can I improve upon? So you build your own self-awareness going into 
the consensus building or decision making environment. And then, you know, think about whose decision is this? Am I here? If we if we lean back on the decision making matrix, is this a conversation where I have influence? I don't have the final decision, and I know that that's my role in this conversation. So again, be aware of what is your role. Okay, are you a decision maker or are you an influencer in this? And so, last but not least, is diversity. Remember that we're bringing many generations together often to talk about various things and to make decisions for a multi-generational family enterprise. And this is the largest time in history that we've had more than four generations involved in family enterprise. And so, you know, our generation of the traditional will think very differently than our Gen Zs. So be open to the diversity. And how can we encourage diversity of thought? And with that, I want to turn it back over to Josh to talk a little bit about fair process with diversity of thought and other things within decision making. Thanks, Jean. Yeah, you know, you, you spoke about, you know, supporting diversity of thought and supporting a safe space. And I found a really good way to do that is by using some principles of fair process. Uh, this fair process model is based on the work of John Ward, who worked with a lot of families and started to really hone in on the importance of some guidelines for how we make decisions together. Uh, and the first of these is respect. You know, everybody who's involved in a decision needs an opportunity to share their perspective and to be heard equally. Everybody's voice matters in a family. And if we set up the situations and the safety and the, the the forums so that everybody's voice can be heard that means everybody can go along with the decision even if they may not agree with the final decision they've had a chance to share their perspective and opinion if somebody doesn't have a chance to share their perspective they have a harder time going along with a decision there's also a commitment among families to good conduct and a genuine effort to finding win-win solutions. Uh, a lot of what I see in effective family businesses is that they do have a spirit of trade-offs, of acceptable compromise, and they really wanna find a win-win solution for everybody involved. And you know what, that takes work. That takes a commitment to take the time and the energy and the effort to reach those solutions. Good conduct, you know, I think this is acting in good faith. And good conduct can be guided by agreements as we'll see in a moment. And, you know, an interesting way to think of good conduct is if, if we videotaped our family meeting, and ask yourselves this, if we videotaped our family meeting, is this something that I would be proud to show to future generations? Would I be willing to show this to future generations? Say, look, we had a really difficult decision. We didn't agree but look how we dealt with it. You know, we had different voices, we listened to each other, and we, we came up with a fair decision in the end. Or is it something that you may not be proud to show to future generations? You know, body language, tension, people's voices not being heard or being discounted. And so I, I think that's just sort of a good uh, checkpoint. You know, are we proud of our process? And is this something we'd be willing to show to other people? Another part of fair process is also a post-decision review. You know, you go through the process, you make the decision, and sometimes just looking back and saying, you know, how did that go? How did that process feel to people? What was effective? What could we do better next time? I think that families can enter into this with a, a learning spirit and saying, we always can learn from our process. How can we do it better next time? And that's how families build on what's effective and the evolution. I see this particularly important as families grow in terms of generations, um, in terms of having married-ins in decision-making process, and with the overall complexity, as the family changes, it's always important to take a step back and say, how are we doing? How did we do with that decision? No surprises means it, everybody has knowledge beforehand of what the matters at hand are, what the decision is, and um, do we have 
making sure everybody has the proper information to make that decision. You know, it's really hard to make a good decision if you walk into the meeting not knowing you're going to make the decision or knowing you have the decision, but you don't have the information. You'd get that right in the meeting. Uh, people sometimes need time to process information. So that's why it's important to have all those all available information and the matters at hand before the meeting. So nobody's being surprised by something. It's hard to make a decision when you're caught off guard. Uh, no conflicts of interest means let's appreciate the multiple roles we play in a family business and working to avoid conflicts of interest or working to acknowledge conflicts of interest. And this may happen where somebody plays multiple roles or a decision, you know, Almost every decision has trade-offs, and people have to appreciate that they may be working for one side of a decision uh, or pulling for a certain decision when they have inherent conflicts of interest. So let's surface those. And I think the, the last thing I'll say about conflicts of interest is the importance of acknowledging those. Uh, no side meetings. And people often say to me, well, no side meetings. Does this mean I can't talk about the decision over here? <laughs> of course, we're going to talk about things offline or have side conversations. But what no side meetings means to me is no side meetings where a decision is made. Of course, you're going to discuss it with people. But when a decision is made in a side meeting, and then what that does is it inhibits the full group process. And I've heard people say, well, yeah, we're going to talk about it, but you know what? Dad and Grandpa already made the decision, so we're just going to go along with what they decided because that's the, the meeting before the meeting. And you know what? That doesn't feel good to people. It's not transparent. It's not above board, and people feel really disenfranchised when there's side meetings where the decisions are made. So be aware of how that may happen in your system and work to avoid that by having the real decision made with the full group. And no rush means, this, this kind of relates to no surprises, you know, people need time to process information. People need time to make decisions and different people operate on different speeds. I'm sure you can think in your family business of those people who get the information, they make a decision and move on. They can do that relatively quickly and sometimes quite effectively. You might also think of some people who need more time to make a decision. They need time to think about the information and they may not be able to make a decision in the moment. They need to sleep on it, sometimes literally overnight, you can come back the next day and make the decision or just take a little bit more time. And I think what's important here is understanding what is our timeline for making the decision. Sometimes we do have to make a decision by the end of this meeting today. Other times there might be more time and you can say, we're gonna, we're gonna review it here and at the next meeting, that's when we make the decision. It may frustrate people who want to make the decision quicker, but that also may bring in people who need more time to make the decision and make sure they feel respected in the process. So knowing the timeline of decisions is really important. So this is an overview of fair process, but what this can lead to is agreements as a family about how we do things. And what this speaks to is developing a code of conduct. Now, if you remember at the beginning, we talked about there's the logistical and structural, but there's also the human and interpersonal. A code of conduct really helps guide the human and interpersonal aspect of decision-making and any interrelating in a family business. So a code of conduct really asks, you know, what's the greater good of the whole? What are the agreements that we can make as a family that will guide how we interrelate and that will guide how we make effective decisions together? So a code of conduct for some families, it might be short, relatively succinct. I've seen code of conducts that run to three or four pages. As the family grows, family grows in complexity and numbers, and the code of conduct has to evolve to match and will grow in size to address some of these major areas, such as communication. How do we communicate together? Code of conduct can also cover decision-making and may incorporate these principles of, of fair process. How do we make decisions together? When that's laid out, everybody feels like 
there's a common understanding of how we do this. Inherent in families, every family I've met, there's always conflict. Um, the important piece is how do we resolve that conflict? How do we make conflict into something that can be constructive and can actually bring us closer together sometimes instead of destructive or something that pulls us apart? And the important part there is conflict resolution. Families that can map out what happens when there's conflict and how we resolve it and what that process looks like tend to be able to deal with conflict in a way that's more effective rather than families who don't understand that and conflicts left open or unresolved, which can be really difficult. So you as a family can walk through what does this look like and how do we want to resolve our conflicts together? Uh, there can also be agreements or a code of conduct around self-management. What are expectations of individuals in a family in terms of meeting attendance, um, in terms of behavior in the meetings? I think something that I'm seeing in more and more families, uh, and this may relate to yours, are what's a cell phone policy for being in a meeting? Um, I think we've all seen where people are in the meeting physically, but they may not be in the meeting mentally because they're on their cell phone. Um, so self agreements around self-management can help guide those individual behaviors. Uh, I see a lot of families too where there's agreements around confidentiality. Obviously, there's a lot of information that gets passed back and forth between the business and the family that's highly confidential and very important to the business function if that information were to get out into the public could be quite damaging to the business. Similarly, a lot of families are quite confidential about personal finances or some of family matters. So expectations and guidelines around confidentiality can be really important for families. All of these can come together in a code of conduct. And what we encourage here is in terms of a code of conduct is starting where you're at, meaning look at what agreements you may already have in place and starting to put those down into paper and then just like the decision matrix, you can identify where are some of those gaps? Where are some of those areas where we haven't had, we're not addressing these in a code of conduct and you can help build that out. Ultimately, a code of conduct is a series of agreements for how you're gonna interrelate as a family. And when those agreements are in place, everybody understands them. It's a lot easier to hold people accountable and it's a lot easier to make effective decisions together. Now, even with fair process, even with a code of conduct, you know what, sometimes you get stuck. And Jean, can you help us understand what to do and how to get unstuck? Um, absolutely, but I want to, I was gonna interject one thing on the code of conduct there, Josh, is, you know, to make your code of conduct, once you develop what it is, how, how to have it real in every meeting. So one of the things that I enjoy doing with my families is we'll get the conduct, come up with maybe the top 10 to 15 um, items in it, then we'll blow it up, we'll laminate it, and we'll post it at the meeting. And at the initial meeting, when we're first agreed upon the code of conduct, at the very first meeting we're gonna operate under it, I get Sharpies for everyone and have them actually sign the code of conduct in a Sharpie on the laminate and it's posted up the whole time. And then I, this is kind of the traveling code of conduct poster until it gets revised. So at additional meetings, regardless of it, a family council meeting, if it's a, a business meeting, if it's a board meeting, whatever, we have copies of this and we post it up so it's visible, it's there, it's alive. It's not just some piece of paper that we've stuffed away or as part of our family constitution, it's there. Sometimes I'll even have some of my families at a family meeting go around and say, okay, what code of conduct do you want to be working on this today. So for example, if you've had a really tough time with um, holding your emotions and becoming explosive, right, that might be in your code of conduct. And that might be one where you say, number three, you know, being attentive to my emotions is something I'm going to focus on. And then at the end of the meeting, we might say, how'd you do with that number three? 
So again, the ability to reinforce it, the ability to make it come alive for your meetings and for your families is really important. So now I'll, I'll jump, thanks for letting me segue back there a little bit, Josh, but now I'll jump into how do you get on stuff, right? Like Josh had mentioned, you know, with their process, we get stuck. We can't get the decisions made. We can't determine who's going to make the decisions. Um, decisions get made uh, in, in an area where we agreed it wouldn't get made. And so we get a little stuck. Well, what happens when we get stuck? I always say, let's go back to some of our anchor posts. And anchor posts to me, because I live by the water here in Charleston, you know, we look at piers and we look at anchor posts, right? That's the thing that when the waters get rough, those, those uh, pylons, those, those anchor posts are going to hold us strong. And so that's what you need to do. What are those anchor posts? What's the vision? Let's go back to, to the vision. Why are we all doing this together? Why is this multi-generational family enterprise important to us? So let's, you know, let's repeat. What are those? What's our mission? What are the core values? And are we doing this? For the greater good of the whole, are we doing this for our own personal gain? I always like to get my families to come back and and say, okay, let's think about five years from now. What do we want to look like five years from now? We've got our vision, we've got our mission, we've got our core values. Now, five years from now is what? 2024? Think about it with your family. What do you look like in 2024? How old are you? What's happening in your family business? So when you can identify and you can look out five years, then you start saying, okay, what are the decisions we need to start making all the way back to now where we're stuck to get that 2024 vision to come alive? And that's where we can get unstuck and get ourselves moving again. And a lot of times using a really great moderator, facilitator, or a great consultant can really help you push through those points. And everybody has them. We all get stuck as individuals, as family members, as family enterprises. And it's the natural progression of life. So don't get too rattled, too upset if you get stuck. But think about some of these things that I just discussed and how you can get unstuck moving forward. So I'm going to turn it back over to Josh to do just a little bit of a recap on the decision-making process and the two key parts. Thanks, Jean. Uh, what we really wanted to leave you with today is that you know decision making has two key parts to it. And as we saw at the beginning, I think we've seen throughout the webinar, you know, there's a logistical and a structural aspect, and a human and an interpersonal aspect to decision making. And that logistical and structural is really understanding where dis different decisions are made. Are they made in a more informal way around the kitchen table? Or are they made in a more formalized system being very clear uh, about where decisions are made at the family council level, where decisions are made at the board of director level, as well as what decisions are made by management? Knowing where those decisions are made is a key part of the logistical and the structural dimension, as well as what are individual responsibilities in that decision-making process? the more that we're clear about roles and responsibilities and where decisions are made, the easier it lets us make effective, timely decisions. So mapping out that logistical and structural elements can help everybody make better and more effective decisions. No matter what, all decisions in family businesses are, are you know, also related to a human and an interpersonal level. Family relationships, uh, communication, the way we interact together is really important. And for this too, we can map out and come to agreements to help us make more effective decisions. As you remember, you know, talking about fair process, these are some guidelines, some big picture guidelines that help families make effective decisions. And that can flow into a code of conduct. This can flow into a series of agreements, which might start small and will absolutely grow over time about how we're going to interrelate together. 
And these agreements can be really effective ways for families to create guidelines so that meetings are more effective, decisions are more effective, and people feel really good about the process. I think in either of these, the process of creating a decision matrix, the process of creating a code of conduct can be really valuable for families. And that's an area where there's a lot of growth potential as Gene showed us for creating the code of conduct and then signing it and the visibility and the importance of saying, this is something we've created and this is something we agree to. And then when people step outside it, as a family, you can gently say, hey, we agreed to this code of conduct and that behavior is not something we agreed to. And it's a nice, gentle way to hold people accountable. So what we'd really like you to leave you with is thinking in your own family about the logistical and structural elements, the human and the interpersonal elements. Think about what you might have in place and then think about what you might need for the future to help you make the most effective decisions together. All right, that's an excellent segue to our Q&A section because this is the time in the program where we have a chance to address your specific situations or questions that arise out of your family. Um, so I, by all means, you should be typing those into the questions pod in your interface. We'll get to as many of those as possible. As you are submitting your questions, I just want to review a couple of additional resources that you may want to consider for additional um, information and education. So first, um, we have the Family Business Advisor newsletter. Many of you already received that. That may be how you heard about this program, uh, but every month we release new information relating to family uh, family businesses that is really valuable in that in a variety of different topics and those articles are all are archived on our website and available for you for reference for sharing with your families um, as you go forward and you'll see that under the resource tab in the article library or you can use that search box at the top of the window um, on pretty much any term you can find you should probably find an article that will be relevant to you. Um, also good to call out here, um, this is Josh's book with his co-author Greg Greenlee, Family Champions and Champion Families. That book specifically talks about the influence that individuals can have in helping their families to put in place um, sort of these structures and behaviors and help them move towards a better decision-making team. So that's a great resource as well, Andy Reid. Um, and then we have a bunch of recorded webinars on other related topics. You can also find those on the website. Um, so we're going to go into Q&A, and we are getting um, several rolling in. Um, one of the things that occurred to me, and, and I've got a question here from Greg that reflects it, is um, oftentimes with earlier stage families, particularly in that entrepreneurial stage, um, the idea of formal decision making can be, uh, may, maybe there's a little resistance to that because we're used to being sort of off the cuff and sort of going with the flow. So um, Greg asks, what is a good way to engage an autocratic founder in a fair decision-making process based on consensus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Josh. So, so I always, I look at it as this, autocratic founder, and I just like to say this founder, right? This founder, you know, they created this, they put a lot of risk in it. Many times their identity is wrapped up in this. This is who they are. This is part of their being as a, as a person, you know? Um, and so I look at it as like the rock, right? And so if I'm looking at this big rock, right, I'm not going to, take the rock and move it all at once, right? It's a lot easier to take the rock and chip it away. So if you're in the next generation, the sibling generation, get together with the siblings. What are the important things? Come up with two or three or four important things that you want to participate in the decision making. And then really talk about the why is it important. So I like to use kind of the, the golden circle rule. Start with the why. Why is it important for you to make that decision? Or as a sibling group, why is it important to be involved in that decision? How could that impact the family enterprise? So then go to the how. And what could be 
create it for the greater good of the whole if you can be involved in those decisions. So again, don't try to move the rock all at once. Really think about taking that rock and carving it out into a wonderful, wonderful stone monument. And how are you going to do that? I'd agree, Jean. I think, you know, little by little, uh, you know, small bites are really important. And what I also like to say to, you know, to people in the founder stage who say, well, you know, I, I've always made these decisions. That's the way it's done. What I like is to have everybody raise their gaze a little and say, well, is that going to work when you're at the next stage of things? And if we want to make effective decisions for the long term beyond the founder, we have to develop that as a skill and as a muscle. And what I like to say to founders is, you know, if, if you want this business to outlive you and to pass it on to your kids, we've got to get them involved in more of the, more of the decisions because one day you won't be here. And if all the decisions are made by you up until that point, and then we turn it over to them, how could we expect them to make effective decisions if they've never had practice at it? So let's have you as a role model, Let's have you as input and mentor, and we start to make more and more of these decisions together bit by bit. But I really like to say to people, what is it gonna take for this business and family to outlive you? And that's where I think we can start to bring in effective decision-making across generations. Perfect. Um, I have an interesting question from Christine as well. Who typically has decision rights regarding the decision matrix? I love the idea, just curious who all should be involved in putting it together. And do you have a couple of examples where in the decision matrix that are particularly tricky to determine decision rights? That's a, that's a great question, Christine. And I think a great starting place for that is the family council. If you have a family council in place and you have that governance structure, I think that's a very effective place to start because I find with a lot of tasks like this, <clears throat> if we put a blank decision matrix in front of a large shareholder group, it can be a very difficult process. But if we take a smaller group, a family council, people who are dedicated you know, to doing some of this governance work, and they can start to work through it, and then they present it back to the shareholders as, hey, here's what we've come up with. This is our best first step at filling this out, what do you guys think? And then people have something to react to. So instead of a large group reacting to a blank and trying to fill it in, you know, there's some thought that's already been advanced and people can react to it and say, this is what we think works. If you don't have a family council in place, you know, this may be an area for a task force where you have a smaller group of, of family owners who can tackle this. If you have a very small ownership group, that may be who you have. You may need to use a facilitator to help you walk through it. Do you have anything to add to that, Jean? I would say, I, you know, everything you said is, you know, thought on. One thing, going back to the earlier question in, in regards to what Christine just asked is, if it's a founder to siblings, oftentimes getting the sibling group together to come up with five to 10 areas for decision making and then to present that and have a discussion with the owner founder on where do they see in the future the decision should be made instead of coming in and saying, well, hey dad, I think we should be making these decisions let dad be a party to that. So it's kind of uh, uh, creating it from the G2 siblings and then taking it back to dad and having a facilitated conversation and let dad have input into it so that he can be looking at the sibling generation as, wow, how does he see them making decisions? So that might be a way to, to help also with question number one. Great, and we are getting a lot of good questions. I'm gonna move along to Wes who asks, are there any suggestions for when and how to bring a third generation or later into decision-making? At what age, at what point, 
And what do you do when cousins have very different ages without causing resentment from the younger cousins? I can uh, tackle that one. Oh, Jeff, do you want to talk, tackle it first? Sure. I mean, I my uh, bias, my trend is towards inclusion and in having people at least involved in viewing the process earlier rather than later. And I find even by the time most adolescents or in their later adolescence, young adults, that they want to be at least involved in the process. Maybe they're not saying much, right? But they're observing, they're learning from people. You know, you've got to think in a family meeting, every time you're meeting together and people are watching, they're looking to you as a role model. So I tend to have like to have people involved sooner so they can learn the process, they can see it, and little by little, they'll start to say more. Now, obviously, there may be some decisions that aren't appropriate for a younger set. So as a family, you can say, all right, we're going to, you know, there may be some boundaries there. But I have found if the family actively engages those younger cousin group, um, sometimes those people feel really respected. And actually, there's a lot of times the insight and perspective that younger generations can bring to, to decisions can be quite important and can open up views that nobody else had thought about simply because they're coming from a different generation and a different worldview. And I've seen some comments by people, you know, in their teens or adolescents who really bring something new and interesting to the table. I, I would agree, Josh. I, I would lean on the side of inclusion. You know, I just was speaking at a, a conference and there was, a, you know, a, a, a young Gen Z and he was he was in the audience and he had so many really amazing things to contribute that others in the audience were like, wow, I never thought about that. But to be able to pull in all perspectives. The other thing is I would also recommend if you have a very um, disparate group of G3s age-wise, maybe the possibility of uh, mentoring, like older G3s um, could mentor younger G3s and team them up in the family assembly or the decision-making process so, so that they have that mentor, which is really a positive thing to have. Good. I'm going to try to do two more questions with the time that we have left. Um, before we dive into them, just so everybody is aware, we have on the screen contact information for Jean, Josh, myself. Um, if you want to learn more about FBCG, if you have additional questions about the content, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us. And, and please just stick around after the discussion for the survey and share a little bit of your thoughts so we can plan for future programs. Um, so a question that you, it sort of touches on this um, question of inclusion and 3G, um, this is from Agnes. How do you avoid in the third generation alliances between the nuclear or sibling branches which are naturally closer? And I think that's one of the things that we get a lot of questions about is, because we are in this generation where you've got multiple nuclear families represented, how do you create a, a, a situation where um, all are sort of operating on the same page and we're all moving towards the same goalposts rather than within our family groups? Hmm. Uh, I think to me, this speaks to a, a sort of a classic family business question, and that is, are we one big family or are we a collection of families? And where I've seen this really work is where families say we're one big family, we make a commitment to operating as one large family, and that we really do a lot of relationship building across family branches and across and as one big family. And particularly at G3, where there is that larger age spread, like in the previous question, that people are really given a chance to get to know each other, not just in the meeting room, right? Not just around a meeting table, but in social situations and having fun, experience building together. And this is the tie-in to decision-making. I like doing a lot of exercises with family that families that have a decision-making element that are fun but get people thinking, you know, there's not a clear answer, but having cousins of all ages and across generations work together to solve some interesting challenges uh, in a way that's experiential, and then being able to talk about that. You know, what did that look like? How was that 
And that's the tie into a fair process. So you can use some of these experiential exercises to build decision-making skills, but to also build mm -hmm. some of those interpersonal skills. And you know what? It builds relationships across generations or even in generations to build that sense of one family together. I think, Josh, you're absolutely right. It's a sense of one family. You know, why are we together? What's in it for the greater good of the whole? And the more we can share, one of the, the ways to really get to know one another and one another's nuclear families that I found very useful is an internal family newsletter. You know, what's happening in the different families? What do they see? And being able to send it out so that we start building those really strong relationships. Are there people that would like to be the family newsletter editor and, and share that? I think those are some important ways to build that whole system uh, community, that ecosystem between all the branches. One trunk, multiple branches. Great. So we're going to do our last question, which is from Sharon. And we've talked today about um, consensus and process and rights. So Sharon's question is, is in some ways tactical. Do you have a recommendation for a decision rule when using a consensus building process? So if you employ voting after a long process of building consensus, what, how do you decide what you need? Is it 60% or 90% to, for, to carry a decision? So how do you think about voting or, or the, the process of formalizing a decision in comparison to consensus building and, and the process of coming to that decision? Mm. Oh, so so I lean on the side of not voting. I hate to say it. I always think that the minute you start voting, you start dividing. Voting is dividing. And so when I build consensus, I really try to build it from small groups to the larger greater good of the whole. So like I said a little bit earlier in my example, if you have 20 people, maybe you have five, five groups of four. And let those four come to consensus together. Okay, let them work through it and then bring the two groups together and let those two groups that have each now made consensus debate and make consensus and grow it from the small to the greater good of the whole and always be asking the question and holding the anchor post you know what is our vision what are our anchor posts if we make the decision this way does it keep us in alignment and is it good for the greater good of the whole? So have some of those compelling anchor post questions in the small group and then build it forward. And that's kind of what I really encourage my families to do and not get into, in, into the voting. John? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, you know, it's not one with a clear answer. But what I would say is, the process of deciding is just as important as what you end up at. And I think it's a great opportunity to connect with other family businesses, say, hey, what did you do? You know, what worked for you? Uh, so you can learn from other families, as well as to use a facilitator to help walk through that process and to have different ideas out on the table, and then to be able to move through the different perspectives to decide what works best for your family. Uh, some families vote, some families work towards consensus, like Jean was saying, that, and, and sometimes that learning from other families is a great starting place, but also using a facilitator to be able to work through what could be some challenging mm -hmm. issues. That process is so valuable for arriving at the end place. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jean and Josh, for your time for your expertise and uh, for sharing so freely with our audience today. Um, thank you to all of the attendees Thanks. for joining us. And we hope that we'll see you at a future webinar. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to reconnecting then. Please do feel free to reach out if you have additional questions and if we can be of help. Thanks, Great. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.